The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's a member of the Society of St. Pius V, and he's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Fine. Thank you, Tom. How are you this evening? Good, Father. Thanks for being here. You're very welcome. Blessed right. Lenten season to you. I wish you the same. Yeah, thank you. I just saying. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure it will be with all the graces. And... Um, you have some fine examples for your little ones, little ones, right? Sure. I'm sure they're already very penitent. <laughs> <laughs> they are. <laughs> All right, well, Father, let's get into some emails uh, for tonight. This first one I thought we could uh, answer is from a viewer who commented on the sermon that you recently gave on Quinn Kajoyism on Sunday. Mm -hmm. When you mentioned the desire to have a society for the sick and invalid dedicated to the 40 holy martyrs of Shabashed. Would you please, Father Jenkins, do an edition of WCB telling the story of the 40 <coughs> holy martyrs and why they would be excellent patrons for the sick and invalid? This would be an excellent program to share with the sick when visiting them. Perhaps a holy card with a prayer to the 40 holy mar martyrs could also be available. Well, that's a good idea. Actually, uh, we should be able to find, find mm -hmm. one, right? Yeah. But it's the sick and the invalids, actually. Uh, the sick and the invalids, those who are confined to bed, and confined to quarters because of illness or injury, or some other debility. And um, the 40 martyrs of Sebaste, right, S-E-B-A-S-T-E, -E, were martyrs of Armenia. When Constantine uh, decreed the liberty of the church, or the, you might say the legality of Christianity, right, uh, he... Uh, actually uh, ended effectively the, the persecution of the empire against the Christians in the West. Uh, it, would be, it would revive for a brief time under Julian the Apostate in about the year 360. But uh, essentially Christianity became legal only when the Emperor Constantine uh, decreed in 313, the Edict of Milan, uh, bestowing legality upon the uh, faith in Christ. But uh, Constantine decided to uh, divide the rule of the empire between himself and a man, Licinius. Licinius was the emperor of the East. Uh, you, might, you might call him actually a Caesar of the Emperor Constantine, but Regardless, Licinius actually um, continued the persecution of Christians in the eastern part of the empire, which included Armenia, uh, within which was the city of Sebastia. And there were some famous martyrs who gave their lives after Constantine legalized Christianity in the year 313. For example, St. Blaise, St. Blaise, whose feast day is on February 3rd, and of course we know him very well for the blessing of throats in honor of St. Blaise on uh, February 3rd. Uh, St. Blaise was the Bishop of Sebast, okay? And uh, the 40 martyrs also um, were martyred after the Christianity was made legal by, Christ uh, by Constantine in the West. Uh, these were 40 soldiers who were condemned to die, and uh, they were condemned by, by being frozen to death. They were stripped and uh, ordered to lay down on the surface of a frozen lake. They would spend the night there. Uh, by morning, they would all be dead except one, actually, the youngest of them all. In the course of the night, one of them weakened, 
and he sought relief in a kind of tepid bath that had been set up as a temptation uh, on the shore of the lake. He crawled over there and tried to climb in, and no sooner did he succeed than he expired. He died. But uh, the soldiers, one of them who was awake anyway, witnessing this event, saw 40 angels uh, come down upon the lake, and uh, they were carrying crowns, uh, one for each of the martyrs. But, uh, of course, one of them had weakened and was not there to claim it. So he decided that he, he would claim that crown. There on the spot, he stripped off his armor and all the rest and went out onto that ice and lay down and joined the martyrs there, and he was the one who claimed that 40th crown that night. Uh, the youngest of them was still still barely clinging to life, and uh, I think his name was Meliton. He, uh, he was only a teenager, he was about 16, 17 years old. And when the soldiers were loading up the corpses, the frozen corpses of the, of the others, into a cart to cart it away, uh, they were leaving Meliton there, they were leaving him hoping that he would weaken. But uh, the boy's mother actually went out of the ice and, and actually dragged him across the ice and uh, with all of her strength lifted him onto the cart with the rest because she didn't want him to, uh, she didn't want him to weaken. She wanted him to have the crown of martyrdom. They had great faith, you know. <clears throat> and Meliton did expire in that cart on the way uh, for the cremation of their bodies. So these 40 martyrs uh, were great witnesses of the faith. That's what the name martyr means, we're actually a witness to the truth of the faith of Christ. And the fact that they were stretched out on the ice and immobilized to freeze to death there and end their lives that way has always impressed me as uh, a great sacrifice, certainly, but also something akin to those who are uh, confined to bed because of great illness or injury, uh, those who are immobilized, as it were, uh, because of debility and left in their sufferings, uh, that they could actually look to these 40 martyrs of Sebast uh, as great examples of courage and could call upon them as intercessors in heaven. And uh, for years, quite a few years now, it, it occurred to me that it would be a great apostolate uh, for someone to um, just gather the, the names of people around the country, even around the world, who are suffering that uh, almost a kind of quarantine, uh, confinement to quarters, uh, because of the illnesses, and to start a league of the 40 crown martyrs of Sebast, and keep in touch with them, actually send them uh, even a little newsletter. I mean, I'd be glad to contribute to it, that's for sure. And uh, would also have prayers that they could offer, uh, invoking these martyrs, and also encouraging, encouraging those in their sufferings to offer that up for the church here in her own, in her own um, passion and suffering, the church being martyred as it were today, by the modernists, okay? Um, you know, in the old days, not that long ago, there were so many religious communities of cloistered sisters and brothers who spent their entire lives in prayer. And they were powerhouses of prayer. It kind of reminds me of the human cell, where you have... Uh, the, um, you know, you, you have power generating elements in the cell, which, which fuel the cell, as it were, which provide that power. And um, now we see so many of those fallen away and destroyed. The church needs that power, the power of that prayer. And she might have to turn to her layman and those who are ill. To, uh, to beseech God for mercy for the church uh, in the world today, and for the, the Catholic people at large. So 
I think this is a, a great source of, uh, well, uh, potentially a great source of grace. Whereas otherwise, you might feel feel people are very much uh, isolated, and they've been tempted to despair because they receive so little comfort in their affliction. But maybe an apostle that, that would bring them comfort in that affliction would also uh, inspire them to offer everything to our Lord with a great generosity and become victim of souls you know, for, the, for the glory of God here on earth today. So I think there's a tremendous harvest of graces to be gained um, by enlisting such people in this great cause. But it would take you know, those who are able and free to devote themselves to it. Mm -hmm. um, so, in any case, that was my thought. Sure. Um, by the way, um, uh, Licinius's continued persecution of the Christian faithful, of the Catholics, in the East was one of the prime factors to move Constantine to make war against him and to defeat him. And um, that defeat of Licinius then was the uh, impetus for Constantine to determine that he would be the sole emperor and would not share the governing power of the empire. And so he, that's what uh, prompted him again to move the capital of the empire from Rome to a city that he built uh, basically uh, out of essentially nothing and name after himself, Constantinople, the city of Constantine, which is now Istanbul. Uh, Istanbul stands over the, uh, the, the ancient city of Constantinople. And um, that set it in, in motion a whole chain of events, right, which affect us even till this day. But um, in any case, our media itself, ironically, or maybe not so ironically, became the first professedly Christian nation in the world. Uh, the country that offered the, uh, the, the lingering martyrdoms you know, after, after the uh, Edict of Milan gave liberty and relief in the West, that uh, area which continued to see the blood of martyrs shed afterwards because of those sacrifices, no doubt, was the first through its king to embrace, officially embrace, uh, faith in Christ. And um, there's a lesson in that for us, that it might seem, it must have seemed to the people there, that this persecution would be interminable. And um, it, the fact that it continued even after Christianity was legalized by Constantine must have made the, uh, the Catholics in the East feel as though they may, may perhaps even suspect that they were abandoned. And yet, look what they were gaining by it. The, uh, the first Christian state on the face of the earth. You know. sure. To this day, the Armenian uh, Catholics are very, very strong. I spoke with one uh, some years ago and asked him how it was that the Catholics of Armenia could hold on with such terrific and incessant persecution from the Muslims. And he said that after all of these centuries of persecution by the Muslims, the Catholics in Armenia were not intimidated by them at all. And they were ready for anything. Uh, they would not give an inch of their faith, right? Uh, they would not surrender any of their faith, despite any amount of persecution. So I find it truly admirable. Mm -hmm. So, but in any case, um, I'd, I'd like to see somehow the, uh, the spiritual forces of our, um, those in the world today who are kind of figuratively stretched out on the ice and uh, spending the remaining days, months, years of their lives in that condition. I'd like to see someone gather the, uh, the power that is there in prayer, in faith, hope, charity, sacrifice and uh, turn that to the benefit of, of others. The church throughout the world today, persecuted by the modernists, mm -hmm. it certainly, certainly is in need of those prayers. Mm -hmm. and Father, we, we receive a lot of emails from viewers who are um, you know, asking for ways to help 
and uh, they wish to, to assist the program in some way. So mm -hmm. perhaps we could um, obtain some assistance from them in this. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they have any ideas, de definitely send us an email. But, right. Father, perhaps another um, great patron. By the way, the, the feast day of the, the 40 Martyrs 40 Martyr. is March 10th. March 10th, wow. Mm -hmm. So just it's just around the corner. Yeah. And we just had the feast day of St. Blaise recently in, in February. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, Father, another patron, though, <coughs> for the sick and invalid, perhaps would be St. Ignatius Loyola. Mm -hmm. uh, we um, received an email from a viewer asking if you could do, uh, do a show on the Jesuits, because he says the Internet seems full of Protestants who were fed lies about Catholics. He says the Jesuits were not always bad, but are getting blamed as far back as St. Ignatius for all kinds of evil atrocities, including tyranny and the roots of globalism. So he says, Father, I'd like to know some details on the truth of the Jesuits. Well, the Jesuits were not bad. The way they were founded, they were very good, actually. The Company of Jesus, <clears throat> or the Society of Jesus, as you might call it, was founded by uh, a man who himself had been an invalid, as you, as you say. St. Ignatius Loyola was a Spaniard who was uh, fighting for a, a worldly prince and was injured in battle. His leg was practically shattered by a cannon shot. Taken to a nearby monastery, he was uh, they tried to set his leg in and uh, they did, but poorly. They had to actually re-break his leg. Now remember, we're, we're talking about times before there were any really effective anesthetics. So uh, they really had to be very... Um, well, they had to endure a lot of suffering. They had to be prepared for it. And St. Ignatius Loyola certainly knew the meaning of suffering. As he was lying in that bed trying to uh, recover, well, his, his leg bone knitted, knit itself together. He had a limp for the rest of his life, though. Uh, finally, when he was able to rise from that bed, he, though he was a changed man. While he was confined to quarters, he read uh, spiritual books. He was reading books from the library of the monastery. And these books were very edifying. And uh, St. Ignatius finally decided that Rather than essentially waste his life fighting for a worldly prince, he would devote his life uh, to the service of Christ the King, which is the only the only service that was worthy. Uh, he believed to devote one's life to. So, when he uh, left that monastery on his own two feet, uh, a little bit shaky, but he did. Um, he went and made a retreat, Manresa. In a cave, he uh, laid the foundation for the uh, for the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius, as they've come to be known, a thirty-day retreat, which is uh, designed to really reflect the transformation that came over the soul of Saint Ignatius himself, and meant to enable uh, us even now to go through that process of thought and uh, reform led by grace that yielded uh, a great champion of our Lord. St. Ignatius went on to the University of Paris uh, where he adopted the life of a scholar. He wanted to use learning now as the tool, not the sword, not cannons, but learning. And so uh, he gathered around him, not, not by force of, uh, you know, uh, anything other than his own sanctity, his love for God, there were other young young men. Now, he was an old man at that time, and he was about, about 40 years old or so, you know, at least mid-30s when he got to the University of Paris, I believe. And so he met these other young scholars. Uh, Francis Xavier was one of them. And they would have been about 20 years old or so, so quite a bit younger than he but they looked up to him, and uh, he used that uh, influence he had over them to inspire in them a uh, great devotion to God. And uh, he formed the company of Jesus around these, uh, out of these young men, shall we say, he formed them into the company of Jesus. Um, of course, 
this required the authorization of Rome, and he received that. Um, but uh, this was a, a great force for the church, for Christ. Um, and uh, they became the educators, pretty much the educators of Christendom. Um, even after the Lutheran, well, we're talking about the time of the Lutheran era here. They combated the errors of Luther. And even in the nations that uh, followed Luther, uh, in Prussia, and in Russia. Um, the Jesuits were kept, even when the, uh, the Catholic Church was persecuted, the Jesuits were, were continuing to teach in the universities and colleges because they really were the educators. And uh, they had a great deal of influence for good. Um, no, they were not corrupted, not yet, okay? Uh, so, so powerful were they in standing up for true faith and, and lo hope and love for Christ that the Masons marked the Jesuits for death. About the year 1600, a man who was baptized, Francois-Marie Arve, a Frenchman whom we know now as Voltaire, said that the, the first step to destroy the church was to destroy the Jesuits. Now his objection, objective was not just to destroy the Catholic Church. Uh, his objective was to completely annihilate Christianity itself. Voltaire said he didn't even want the memory of Christ, of Jesus Christ, to remain in the world. Because as he said, if it, only the memory of Christ remains, then that memory will cause the faith in Christ to rise from the dead. That's what he said. So he said, we have to destroy even the very memory of Christ, obliterate the memory of Christ. He said, we have to start by destroying the Jesuits. So that was a great tribute to the Jesuits, a great tribute. Uh, he was actually uh, in one of their schools, and he was known to be a real wiseacre, a real troublemaker, Voltaire. As a young man, he was already full of mockery and contempt and derision for anything sacred. In fact, once uh, in the dining, the story is told that they were there in the dining room, and he is a young student, um, was very amused with the rest of them when a, a, a donkey ran into the dining room. Uh, chased by a brother, a Jesuit brother. And the donkey was running around wildly, trying to find his way out, and the brother was chasing after him. Finally, the donkey found, found a way out and hastily departed with the brother madly in, on the uh, trail after him. And Voltaire shouted out, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Uh, which is, of course, from the beginning of St. John's Gospel, we recognize part of the last Gospel of Mass, referring to our Lord, and basically uh, referring to the, the donkey as uh, playing the part of our Lord there. So the man was uh, really just seething with mockery and contempt. Uh, uh, that's how he made his living. That's how he made a name for himself. And uh, he eventually died under very sad circumstances, calling, crying out for a priest, actually. But his fellow Masons, his fellow, I should say, revolutionaries, his fellow encyclopedists would not allow a priest to go to him. They barred the way. And so they say that Voltaire actually died clawing at the walls, you know, crying out for a priest to come. Uh, the fact that he said, though, that if the memory of Christ were allowed to remain, that the, the faith in Christ would rise from the dead, that showed he had some faith. It takes faith to think, to realize that. Attribute the power of resurrection to the faith. But in any case, um, no, the Jesuits were quite good. And they stood for the faith. They gave, they gave many martyrs for Christ. Sent many missionaries for Christ all over the world. Right? The North American martyrs, St. Jean de Beboeuf, uh, St. Isaac Jogues, 
right? And someone uh, who died on our shores in the 1600s here, uh, tortured unspeakably, but patiently. Uh, they suffered patiently for Christ, gave marvelous example. And St. Francis Xavier himself, of course, and his trips to India, and finally seeking to get onto the shores of Japan, right? Uh, to spread the gospel. Um, but the Jesuits were suppressed. The Masons uh, had, were determined to destroy them because they were standing in the way of the Mas Masonic uh, agenda. Okay? So um, the, the most Christian kings of France, Spain, Portugal, were convinced by their prime ministers, all three of whom were Masons, to suppress the Jesuit, the Jesuits within their kingdoms and their colonies. That affected the Jesuits who were in the reductions down in Paraguay, who were actually uh, driven out by the troops of, uh, of the, the Portuguese king. That affected the uh, the Jesuits who were missionaries out in California, the Lower California, and um, they were replaced by the Franciscans. In many places, uh, in the French and Spanish and Portuguese colonies, the Jesuits were rounded up at bayonet point and marched onto ships, and taken out, and and sometimes even not even deposited on shore. Sometimes they were deposited in the in the waters of the sea. They had to swim for their lives and they moved off the coast of Africa. Many of them died that way. They were replaced by Franciscans as Father Juan de Sara came to um, Southern California that way. His, his Franciscans were sent there to replace the Jesuit missionaries who had begun the mission work there. But uh, finally, the pressure on the Pope succeeded in getting the church itself to suppress the Jesuits. It wasn't just the French king and the Spanish king and the, and the Portuguese king in the early 1700s who suppressed the Jesuits within their realms. There was a, there was a pope, uh, it was very strong. Had actually, a pope was probably of all the popes, the, the one primarily responsible for spreading the devotion to the sacred heart of our Lord and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And that was Pope Clement XIII. He was under extreme pressure to suppress the Jesuits, and he would never, never do it. And yet, he was induced to name a Franciscan as a cardinal. And that Franciscan, having been named a cardinal by him, when Clement XIII died, that Franciscan Cardinal became the next Pope, Clement XIV, and he was the one they succeeded in pressuring into suppressing the Jesuits. And the document with which he did that is pathetic, because he was talking about uh, the reasons why he was suppressing the Jesuits, and it finally came down to what he said were reasons known in our own hearts that he couldn't say. But it was actually the Masons who were pressuring him into this. And so that extinguished the Jesuits throughout the entire world. Uh, the church itself, basically, had annihilated the Jesuits. Did it affect us here? Actually, it did. John Carroll, Father John Carroll, was a Jesuit until one morning when he wasn't, when he woke up and found that the religious order of the Jesuits had been annihilated by the church, by Clement XIV, who... Uh, I have to say in a very cowardly way, um, succumbed to the pressure that his predecessor Clement the Thirteenth withstood all that time, and um, it, it was actually it was actually terribly sad because the, this is this Franciscan cardinal who became the Pope, Clement the Fourteenth actually imprisoned the Superior General of the Jesuits, imprisoned him in the uh, in the. Um, uh, Castle Sant'Angelo in Rome, the fortress there, and uh, kept him as a prisoner until he died. 
Uh, he didn't deserve that. He did nothing to warrant that. But again, this was a satanic hatred, uh, which was directed against the Jesuits through the Masons. Right? Well, the Masons uh, uh, actually um, triumphed temporarily. Okay, they um, managed to drive the Jesuits out of the missionary work throughout the colonies. But uh, as about a generation later, about 40 years later, the Jesuits were restored. But Tom, when the Jesuits were restored, it's as though they were never the same. As though something had been lost, some continuity that took them back to the spirit of St. Ignatius Loyola. And that is when we began to see some kind of cracks in the, in the masonry, so to speak. And uh, as you know, the Jesuits were a prime target of the Masons for subversion then. St. Ignatius, no doubt, would have rather seen them suppressed than to see them subverted and used as a prime vehicle for, for modernism. But that's what the Jesuits had become. And of course, the apotheosis of the Jesuit modernists is Francis Bergoglio himself, right? So uh, now the, the current head of the Jesuits uh, doesn't even believe in the devil, mm -hmm. right? Basically just thinks of him as sort of a symbol. And um, I mean, it's, the, the fall of the Jesuits is just tragic now. Uh, oddly enough, the enemies of the Jesuits uh, tried in the 17, late 1700s and the early 1800s to paint them as a sort of like a Catholic equivalent to the Masons. Uh, Dr. John Robinson was a, a Protestant who, who attacked the, the Jesuits in that way, but um, he never really knew what the Jesuits were, honestly. It was, what he was criticizing was a caricature of the Jesuits. Father, the, the story, it, uh, it almost reminds one of the, uh, the Battle of Troy where the, uh, the Greeks, they tried for, what was it, 10 years, I believe, to, to win the, the city of Troy. Mm. And with all of their efforts, they were not successful until they actually got within the walls of the city with the famed mm. Trojan horse. Right. And it seems that um, essentially is what happened here with all of, you know, all of the, the Jesuit martyrs that we had uh, throughout all of those years, and it wasn't really, like you said, until the Jesuits were actually suppressed by the church from mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. that it really was... Um, and, re and reconstituted. Right. But they were never the same after. Uh, they were not the same. Right. No, no. Right. So, um, and they were actually turned into a vehicle of revolution, mm -hmm. uh, modernist revolution. Right. Now, that's the saddest part of all, right? Right. But still, we have to, uh, you know, continue the spirit of St. Ignatius Loyola. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a Jesuit to do that. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, I hardly recommend to anybody who has the opportunity to make the spiritual exercises mm -hmm. of St. Ignatius to, to catch some of that a sense of that spirit of St. Ignatius. Mm -hmm. which is, uh, this is the church militant, and St. Ignatius brought to the order of the, of the Jesuits that sense of militancy for their faith, for our Lord, and their love for Him. And uh, they were extremely successful in that, which actually, with, that's what drew, the, drew the, the hatred of hell to them, against them, you know. One, one wonders if, uh, if Clement XIII had been followed by a heroic pope, like himself, and not by a, a coward, who would have succumbed to the pressure and the threats of the Masons. Um, what would have happened otherwise? But of course, we can only speculate, right? <laughs> so, uh, well, now, now we, we find Francis is now talking about canonizing Pedro Arupe, the, the Jesuit superior who was the, basically a Marxist. And uh, that would be very much in the, in the uh, line of Francis to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Francis' thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see if he if he does that. Right. Looking at who else he's been canonizing so far, and I use the word loosely. Uh, yeah, Pedro Rupi would be a nice, a good candidate now. 
Sure. Well, Father... After Archbishop Romero and so on. <laughs> and all yeah. the rest. Well, Father, in keeping with the, uh, the theme of real Catholic saints that we've been talking about on the program, I would be remiss if I didn't mention St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, my patron saint whose feast day was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought there's a nice parallel between him and uh, St. Ignatius Loyola that we've been talking about. I remember hearing a, a, a sermon once given on St. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, and while he was bedridden and he was reading all of these books of, of the lives of the saints, uh, he had this, this realization where he said, if, if all of these saints could do it, why can't I do it? If, why, why them and not me? And I thought that parallels nicely with a, a famous story from St. Thomas Aquinas' life where I, I believe it was a, a nun who came to him for some spiritual advice and she asked him how to become a saint. And this great St. Thomas Aquinas, the most famous theologian of all time, perhaps, uh, with all of the, the, the works that he had written and, and all of that, his answer was only two words. He said, will it? Mm -hmm. And so I thought there's a nice parallel there between this idea that St. Thomas has where you, all you have to do to attain your salvation is only will it, and this mm -hmm. idea of St. Ignatius where he says, if, if all of these saints can do it, why can't, why can't mm -hmm. I do it? Why can't I will that as well? Mm -hmm. so Father, is there a lesson there that we can learn today from these two oh, saints? Oh, sure. I think you just said what it is. You know, okay. Sanctity is within the grasp of those who are willing to will it and mm -hmm. to say that I want to become a saint and I will do the practical things necessary to, to do that. Um, you know, the formula for sanctity is not rocket science. I mean, our Lord has told us, He's given us the Beatitudes. He's given us the two great commandments, right? And He's told us the way. You know? a, a rich young man came to our Lord one day and said, Lord, what, what must I do to have ever everlasting life, right? And our Lord answered him. And then uh, when the young man said, well, I've kept the commandments from my youth, our Lord said, well, then, if you want to be perfect, leave what you have for the poor and come follow me, you know, devote your life to me. My example, follow, that's what we need to follow now. And um, so again, our Lord himself has not only provided the formula, as it were, he's provided the example, the living example of the life of the formula. So uh, it can be done. That's why you find saints of uh, not only great thinkers like St. Thomas Aquinas, but also the, the most humble rustic too. Sure. You find uh, saints in the children, the little children. And uh, it all begins with the decision to want it to be, to, uh, to love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, mm -hmm. and to work for that to cooperate with the grace of God, to ask God for the grace and then cooperate with Him going forward. You know, St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas taught at the University of Paris, the fledgling University of Paris, and uh, it was there that Ignatius repaired after his conversion. 300 years later, Ignatius was a student at the University of Paris. Uh, studying th theology and philosophy, where St. Thomas Aquinas had taught. So certainly he would have been inspired by the example of that great Jesuit, that great uh, Dominican. Um, so there were kindred spirits, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Father, one other point with St. Thomas Aquinas. He, had, he was very well known for his devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. He, yeah. he wrote much on, on the Blessed Sacrament. He even composed many hymns. To the, mm -hmm. to the Blessed Sacrament, we just yeah, seven hymns. So. Just mm -hmm. uh, just minutes ago, finished o the yeah. benediction over in church, singing the the hymns the mm -hmm. uh, O Salutaris and Tantum mm -hmm. Ergo, which I believe both were composed. Those are just fragments of the of the longer hymns. Sure, composed mm -hmm. by Saint Thomas. But Father, what what did Saint Thomas Aquinas kind of see in the Blessed Sacrament, and why did he consider that so important? He saw what the Church sees that the. The very author of life and the author of grace himself is present there, right? It is called the Blessed Sacrament, or the Most Blessed Sacrament, because it not only is a, a vehicle of grace, there you have the, the very source of grace himself there, right? You, have the re, you don't only have the effects of the redemption, you have the Redeemer himself personally present there. Um, body and blood, soul, and his, his divine person. He's a, it's, 
the, the, it's our Lord Jesus Christ conceived of the Virgin Mary, uh, crucified, died, buried, risen, glorified. He is there. He is there. And St. Thomas Aquinas saw that through the eyes of faith. And um, it was the great devotion of his life because he, he uh, believed wholeheartedly in our Lord's, our Lord's promise that he would be present there. Sure. Uh, so St. Thomas Aquinas, through faith, could see what the angels actually see right. uh, before, before heaven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was his great desire. That was his great longing. Sure. Um, you can learn a great deal from him. He wrote about the Blessed Sacrament um, very powerfully. As St. Augustine wrote about the Blessed Trinity uh, 1,200 years before him, very powerfully. Well, no, actually not, not 1,200 years. Actually, I would have to say more like eight, 900 years before him, actually. But uh, they were writing about mysteries that the human mind could not fathom. And yet, when they wrote, they wrote with a devotion that go, went far beyond the power of human reason. Uh, they, as St. Paul says, through faith we see through a glass in a dark manner. But these were men who were really mystics, who really had... Uh, God was revealing mysteries of himself to these, these great saints. And so they wrote with a fervor and devotion. Uh, and a love that even went beyond mere human knowledge. Mm -hmm. Well, Father, in closing, do you have any words of advice uh, for this Lenten season? We're only a couple days into it now, so what, what can we do to have a, a good and beneficial Lenten season? Will it. Will it. <laughs> will it, <Okay>. yes. <laughs> you have to start by willing it. Right? <laughs> you have to make up your mind, first of all, to uh, follow the, the Church's program. Right? If, you're obliged to fast, then fast, right? The uh, fast, all the days, Monday through Saturday, are days of fast. Sunday is never a day of penance because it is a miniature Easter and always a day of, of celebration and rejoicing. Uh, with the fast, there is the abstinence, partial abstinence, uh, except on Friday, which is a day of complete abstinence from, from meat, right? And, of course, also giving up. Uh, sacrificing some, something, it's very traditional to do that, of course. We teach the children to give up something as a sacrifice during Lent. Um, but also to devote more time to uh, worshiping and honoring our Lord, Stations of the Cross, attending Mass, receiving our Lord in Holy Communion, and to wean oneself off of the corruptions of the world and the distractions of the world. Um, you know, nowadays people are addicted to the screens, um, and that would be a very good start right there, to basically push that away, throw a towel over it, whatever you have to do, unplug the thing, um, and um, to uh, not use it as any means of entertainment, you know, that would be a great sacrifice for someone today. Mm -hmm. Um, and to declare their independence from this medium. Um, so that would be a good start for someone who wanted to offer something up to our Lord. Um, others, traditionally, we go up candy or desserts or uh, if somebody would give Brussels sprouts one. Oh, that's good. One. <laughs> I mean, it probably wasn't much of a sacrifice. So. <laughs> but anyway, um, but it, it is meant to be a sacrifice that you you feel mm -hmm. so that it's you know you can't offer something up as a sacrifice and, and something you would never even think about for the rest of Lent. It has to be a conscious, deliberate sure. offering of something that appeals to you. Right. Um, but it's also very important is to adopt a a program of spiritual reading during Lent that kind of coincides with the spirit of Lent to focus on our Lord's passion and death. And um, which is really focusing on the great love that he had that moved him to carry that cross to Calvary, die on it for us. So it's a very thoughtful time. It's meant to be a time when we uh, follow Christ more closely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the 
gospel tells us that when our Lord was taken from Gethsemane, Peter followed at a distance, yeah? and then later denied our Lord. But uh, we are meant to follow our Lord as John the Apostle did, much closer. And Lent is the time for us to do that. Sure. Well, Father, thanks for being here tonight. I appreciate your time. Oh, you're very welcome, Tom. Thank you. No problem. Blessed Lent to one and all. Thank you, Father. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.